I think, you know, your second question, I, I sort of take that as, well, how do you study such a complicated problem in the operating room and, and in the clinic? Because uh, I mentioned the operating room because that's sort of the first step here. Uh, first, we want to, we have, uh, just to clarify, we have a um, NIH-funded uh, trial approved by the FDA for, for research to do this first in human study. Um, we've treated two patients. We have four more to come at Penn. In, um, and in this study, uh, it's something I've been working towards my entire career. Uh, what we don't know is where in the nucleus accumbens will we identify cells or regions that seem to be uh, involved in this sort of reward-seeking behavior. I would call it appetitive. It's kind of like appetite, but the word appetitive is, I think, a, a good word to use. What, what part of the nucleus accumbens is appetitive? Is the whole thing appetitive? Probably not. It's huge. In my world, it's huge. As a neurosurgeon, you know, I, I target parts of the brain that are three or four millimeters in size. The nucleus accumbens is almost a centimeter in size. Wow. I didn't so, realize it was that large. Yeah. This sort of like reminds me of discussions around the amygdala. Everyone thinks amygdala fear, yeah. but amygdala has got a lot of different subregions. Yes. And stimulation of certain areas of the amygdala makes people feel great. That's right. And other stimulation of other areas makes them feel terribly afraid. Exactly. And, and that shouldn't surprise us because, you know, when we treat patients with Parkinson's disease for tremor, you know, if we're in one part of the subthalamic nucleus, we'll help their tremor. If we're in another part of the subthalamic nucleus, the neurologist is looking at me like, why isn't this working? And that shouldn't surprise us. We already know that, you know, two or three millimeters deviation or two or three millimeters away from where we want to be, and you might not have the result you want. And that's probably also true for these more limbic structures like the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens. Uh, so, you know, regarding the nucleus accumbens, we traverse some of the nucleus accumbens, not all of it, in order to place the electrode that we want to use to detect when cravings are happening, for example, and to try to block the cravings from leading to the behavior related to the, the reward seeking, which is the overeating in this case. Uh, so what we decided to do in the operating room was to actually try to leverage a tool that we use all the time when we take care of patients with Parkinson's. So with Parkinson's, these, a lot of these patients, not all, have tremor. And so when we place an electrode into this motor structure to try to improve their movement disorder, uh, we often can hear tremor cells and they sound, we convert their electrical signal to an audible signal so we can actually hear it. Um, and, and it sounds kind of like the tremor looks, like the frequency of the signal is the same as the hand shaking. So Exactly. And so the, the patient with Parkinson's is, is trem trembling. Yep. They're awake and you're poking around yep. in a, in a, Dedicated, careful way, yes. of course. One poke want, at a time. One poke at a time yeah. uh, with a very fine wire, a set of wires, yeah. listening to the electrical activity until you uh, you encounter some cells that are sending out electrical activity That's right. at a similar frequency. Exactly. And then you can stimulate them or quiet them and see if the yes. tremor goes away. So we, we are very confident that when we stimulate that area of, in this case, the subthalamic nucleus, uh, we will, we will make that tremor. We will disrupt that tremor circuit and that tremor will dissolve. And it does. That's why Parkinson's is so beautiful and inspiring in, uh, from a surgery. And surgical. tractable. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but what is the- It makes us feel we understand the brain, right. at least in that limited way. So what is the um, analog to tremor in terms of appetite and desire to binge? Craving. So craving is a term- that, you know, there's probably other terms we could use, by the way, but that, that's the term we've chosen to use for a number of reasons. One, because people relate with that term. People that have binge eating disorder or obesity, they, if you ask them if they crave, the answer will often be yes. Um, if you ask them if they lose control or binge, they might not know what you mean, or they might not actually feel out of control, even when they are. Um, so, uh, but the word craving is relatable. And so we set out to see if we could identify craving cells. Um, in a patient with OCD, which is related, in fact, we target a very similar part of the brain, uh, we tried to identify cells related to obsessions. And we believe we did do that. It was a single case study uh, where we tried to optimize where our electrode was placed. So we had some 
proof of concept that we would be able to elicit a sort of disease-specific symptom in the operating room, assuming the patient could tolerate being awake. Not everybody needs to be awake for this procedure, but at least for these first in human trials where um, we're, trying, we're trying to establish where in the brain we need to be, uh, I think this type of approach is really critical. And, you know, by the way, none of this has been published, uh, but I think it's so important for people to know this. So I, I am willing to share some aspects of what we're trying to do. Um, but uh, but that's, that's really the first goal of this trial is to identify where in the nucleus accumbens we can detect these craving cells. So we have to provoke food craving in the operating room. That's the first thing. How do you do that? Ah, well, um, there are some uh, somewhat validated ways to do that. Um, so for example, we asked patients to provide pictures of food that they rate very highly as something that they would typically crave. And you know, depending on the patient, uh, it might be something that's very salty. It could be very sweet, like a donut. Um, donuts are good. Oh, I love donuts. Right. Donuts or, are great. You should they, you should try the cronut when you're here in New York City. <laughs> I just might. I try not to eat that sort of thing for I, all the reasons they change your bite. brain. It's worth, worth one, one bite. bite. Okay. Uh, just try to stop yourself after that one bite. So if I were one of these patients, given the fact that uh, the binges come on pretty seldom once a day, do you you I imagine you have them come to the the operating room fasted or semi-fasted. They're fasted, yep. Okay, they're fasted, which probably there are probably surgical yes. reasons for wanting that too. Yes, they kind of uh, have to be. <laughs> right. And then you they've you've done the craniotomy, you've removed a patch of skull, yes. lowered the wire into yes. the nucleus accumbens, and then they are viewing pictures of food that they crave and thinking about it. Do they have um olfactory cues, smells of cronuts and Yeah, donuts? I would love to do the olfactory cues. We haven't implemented that, but that is a, a great, uh, thank you, for, and I'll give you full credit when we do. Sure, uh, I didn't <laughs> review the grant, but I, it sounds, I'm so glad this work is funded because I mean, yeah. this is when I, I'll make, this time it's not a joke when I refer to you all, uh, you neur neurosurgeons uh, as the astronauts of the brain, you know, this is out on the extreme edge of what we don't know. Yeah about how the brain functions. And this is so far and away different than giving a mouse access to a high, high fat food. Not that that, I'm not being disparaging of the mouse work, but so the person says, well, I'm the patient in this case. So I might say, you know, I'm hungry. A donut sounds really good right now, yeah. but craving to me is like, I, you know, I'll cross the street, cross town, be late for my meeting, eat three of these. Yes maybe even hide that from somebody that cares about me, that doesn't want me doing this, this yes. kind of thing. Hide it from myself. Yes. <laughs> this, these kinds of behaviors I'm projecting. I'm fortunate that um, I, I have cravings for things in life, but uh, donuts are not among the more extreme of them. So, um, so this is all happening in real time mm -hmm. and you're listening to the cells the same way you would listen to it and search for tremor cells. Exactly, same exact tools. And you're doing that by... Um, recording from a, a small population of cells in the area? Yeah, in fact, yeah. It, we do get multi-unit activity, which is multiple cells, uh, but we really try to find one, a single unit to listen to. One neuron. Yeah, because it's just um, much easier to understand what that one neuron is doing versus trying to listen to multiple. And uh, we also uh, measure local field potential recordings, but those are analyzed, which is more of a population response, thousands of cells. Kind of a uh, chorus of cells. Exactly. Um, that we measure offline. Um, the device that we use to um, sort of treat these patients or intervene uh, that we're studying, uh, it, it can't do single unit recordings. It's only doing these more population responses. So we correlate what we see in the operating room at the single unit level to the population response, but we do that all offline. Um, and I can explain that um, in a moment. Uh, but yeah, so we, we try to identify these craving cells. And uh, because this is a, a feasibility study um, and we can't you know, be in the operating room searching for hours and hours and hours, we do have some sort of, we have guidelines that we've set for ourselves that we've uh, developed with the NIH or the FDA to make sure that what we're doing is feasible and safe as well. Um, so. We, we will spend a limited time trying to identify these uh, craving cells. But another uh, sort of um, strategy that we think is really important is um, the effect of the stimulation. 